Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption reporter and journalism lecturer. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic and political crises that we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. My guest this week is none other than John Verveke. John is an assistant professor in cognitive psychology and cognitive science at the University of Toronto. He is a world-renowned thinker, bridging science and spirituality in order to understand the experience of meaningfulness. How to have meaning in life, how to cultivate meaning in life, why it's important for humankind, and why what he calls the meaning crisis is driving us off the precipice into, well, into the void, really. John has a 50-part series called The Meaning Crisis on his YouTube channel. He also has an online course that he developed during the pandemic to help people cultivate meaning. Both of these are extremely popular. His work is just so well-respected, and you will see why the minute this conversation starts. We discuss the meaning crisis, his work, from cognition to spirituality, and why it's important to understand what to do about the meaning crisis. And we then apply it to the meta crisis, the poly crisis, the climate crisis, the economic crisis, the energy crisis. And John explains how it is this interaction of the meaning crisis and the meta crisis that produces the world we live in today. He also says that any attempts to tackle the meta crisis without also tackling the meaning crisis will simply not work. This is just such an astonishing conversation. I absolutely adored speaking with John. I'm definitely going to have him back on in the future, but for now, this is just a phenomenal introduction to his work, I think, and also just to what it is to be human and why it is so important that we better understand ourselves, our fellow man, and what it is that we can best achieve with the time we have on this planet. I hope you all get as much out of this episode as I did. If you do, please share it far and wide. If you're loving the show, support Planet... If you're loving the show, support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. The link is in the description box below. By signing up, you'll also get access to the weekly article I write, inspired by each interview. Thank you to everyone who has signed up. As a 100% free and ad-free project, Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the community. So thanks so much to all of you who are supporting the show to keep it going every week. John, thank you so much for making time for Planet Critical. It is such a pleasure to have you on the show. It's my pleasure, Rachel. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So you investigate and research the meaning crisis. Uh, for mm -hmm. listeners that haven't come across your work, um, I was going to originally start by asking, what is the meaning crisis? But I want to be even a little bit more precise. Can we define meaning and then crisis and launch into what is the meaning crisis? Yes. So by meaning, I don't primarily mean semantic meaning, the meaning of your words. I mean what people... Uh, in psychology and elsewhere and cognitive sciences uh, call meaning in life. Uh, this is your sense that your life is meaningful such that it is worth continuing to live your life with all of its frailties and failures and frustrations, um, yet nevertheless, your life is worth living. And I mean it that starkly. Mm. Um, and what people are typically talking about is they're using meaning as a metaphor. So a sentence has meaning insofar as you can determine if it's true or false. For example, the cat is on the mat, so, right? Um, and what people are saying is there's something about how their lives make sense to them that is similar to how a sentence makes sense to them, connects their minds to reality. Like, so a sentence is meaningful and that it could be true, which connects you to reality. And so primarily what people are talking about in meaning in life is their life makes sense to them such that they feel connected to the reality of who they are, mm -hmm. the reality of other people, and the reality of the world. And that is intrinsically valuable to human beings. Can human beings want to feel connected to something that has an existence and reality beyond themselves. Okay. Can I pause there and do a little of bit course. of digging on some of those words? So yeah. if meaning is meaning in life, um, that a person's life is inherently with, worthwhile to them, that sounds like meaning is, by its very essence, then a subjective thing. But you no. Are, oh, no. No, no, no. Right. Uh, so that, so that, that's the, that was the point of the last point I just made. Uh, <laughs> it's not subjective in that people want to be, need to be, 
connected to something that has a reality and a value independent of their existence. Um, and in that, of course, by definition, can't be something that's merely a subjective preference or a desire. Now you can say, well, they want that for themselves, but what they want is to be in relationship to something whose value is not primarily subjectively given. So that's the, that's why it doesn't mean um, it's it, it's a purely subjective thing, because the 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 nature of mattering is you want to make a difference to something that would exist or have a value even if you did not exist. And so it is the very fact of having that relationship rather than the thing that you choose that it provides the objective benefit to to human beings. As long as you have good reason, and we could talk about what that might mean, to <laughs> believe or more appropriately to sense, not just a sensation or perception, but like when we talk about making sense, to sense that what it is you are mattering to real. Uh, often people will want it to be significantly real or deeply real in some important ways. So you don't want to like, you don't want to, you know, collect, well, you, you can, but most people wouldn't agree that you've made your life meaningful by collecting all the, all the porcelain cows that have ever been created <laughs> and you've got this collection and look at how, right. Uh, cause all those, those cows are real, that, that their reality doesn't seem to have much connection uh, to explaining or making sense of the rest of the world. So it's kind of isolated, but you want to connect to something that helps, right? Is a center from which other people can make sense of their world and um, how they should better fit to it. Could this not be a form of, I'm going to say it, even though I know these terms don't work together, but like collective subjectivity, because the thing that first comes to mind when you say this is obviously God, religion people having a relationship to something bigger than themselves, people, ha people having a center from which all other things um, exist. And yet, whether or not God exists, um, whether or not those myths are inherently true, whether or not they're based in reality, um, there is no way of, of knowing those things. Um, there's no way of knowing that God exists. It's not that God shines his light on you. It's that you choose to believe that that light could exist, perhaps. So there's still, I don't know, it still seems funny to use these words like reality um, well, when I'll, discussing I'll, meaning at that level. I'll, I'll put aside arguments about whether or not it, uh, we could rationally believe in God or something like that, because um, sure. I think that is <laughs> genuinely open to question. Um, what, what I would say is um, that is your take on people who have a relationship to God. It is mm. not their take, right? The, mm -hmm. it, if you were to convince them that God only exists because only exists as an intersubjective shared belief, uh, they would lose a lot of the meaning in their life. Um, just as if I was to convince you that the person you are in a romantic relationship isn't real, but it's just a computer avatar <laughs> that we've convinced you, your life would lose a lot of meaning dramatically. And, and the opposite's sure. the case. I do this with a lot of my students. I'll say, how many of you are in deeply satisfying romantic relationships? Because romantic relationships are, are, are the secular version of God in our culture right now. We try to make them the bearers of all meaning and history and culture. And of course, they can't bear that weight, but we'll put that aside. So we ask people, I ask people that, and then I say, okay, of the people that said they were in really, you know, really good romantic relationships, how many of you would want to know if your partner was cheating on you, even if it destroyed the relationship? And almost all of them put their hands up. They don't want the relationship, no matter how subjectively wonderful it feels, if their partner is cheating on them. Yeah. And then I said, well, why? Why would you want to destroy this wonderful relationship? Because they, they say, because the relationship wouldn't be real. So here's my students. They're like supposed to be hard-bitten skeptics and postmodern, and right, but, but because it isn't real. And they invoke that without hesitation to explain why they, yeah. without hesitation, would want to know if the relationship is fraudulent in some manner. And that's the point I'm making. That's the point. I'm, now, they could be wrong. Their partners could, in fact, be cheating on them. So I'm not claiming that when people make this claim about mattering, they have a, they have a proof of the objective truth. But what I'm saying is it matters to them in so much as they sense it to be real. Mm. Okay. So those are two I different just... qu questions. And I don't, and I don't, I don't want, I want to see, I'm trying to keep the question of meaning and the question of truth distinct from each other, yeah. because, uh, 
determining truth first determine it depends on determining meaning. If I say to you, all giggle frips can completely frip nah, you don't know if that's true or false because you don't know what it means. And so we we have to, I'm trying to keep these separate and show that, right, we can examine the meaning question it, it, uh, separately uh, from, I'm not saying ultimately, ultimately we should make sure our, our beliefs are true, et cetera, but I'm trying to make an analytic distinction here. Right. And just a quick tangent on the existence yeah. of God and the intersections okay. of shared belief. <laughs> just, just a quick one, <laughs> because I... <laughs> Because you, um, Buddhism is very important to you and it's something that you teach and it's something that you engage with. But Buddhism is a faith sure. that does not have uh, a God. So would that not sure. be an example of, of an intersubjective faith actually being the, the center point of, for a group of people? Ah, but see, Buddha, and, 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 I, I, and I'm a non-theist. I think the idea that God has to be a person-like entity and that sacredness has to reside in sort of some ultimate personal being, I think I, 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 I would... I reject both that presupposition shared by the theist and the atheist. I think that framework is wrong. Buddhism and Taoism are clear examples. Neoplatonism in the Western tradition mm. is a clear example. What I would say to you is Buddhism has shunyata. The Taoism has the Tao. Uh, Neoplatonism has the one. And these are not personal beings. These are not beings that ha have, you know, something like self-awareness or consciousness or the ability to think in, in any ways analogous to ours except uh, by very stretched metaphors, but that doesn't mean that the, that the Buddhist doesn't regard shunyata as sacred, namely that uh, getting into right relationship with that ultimate reality is of ultimate concern, to use Tillich's model. Same thing with the Neoplatonists. Uh, having the right relationship to the one is an, an ultimate concern. Same thing with the Taoist. And, uh, mm. and, I, and people always have, um, at least implicitly, they, they, there's kind of, they have to have um, something like what they regard as the ultimate real that cons uh, comports to their ultimate concern. So, you know, even somebody who's a, I'm a materialist and I just work to make a m m the most money. They, of course, believe that money is in some sense ultimately real or the ultimate reality that has to, that they have to be in relationship with. That's what I'm talking about. Mm, right. Okay. Interesting. Why, why do we need to have this relationship with something other than ourselves? And what happens to us when we lose it? Well, um, now that's, that, that, that's an argument uh, that goes to the core of what my cognitive scientific work and precisely where it bridges into uh, this more existential spiritual. We don't have quite the right term. I tend to use the term aspirational to cover uh, existential, spiritual, because both of those are loaded terms. Um, so I've, I published a lot on this in, in academic journals, just have a couple articles published like last year and this year. So it's an ongoing thing. Um, and it's a huge argument. So I'll, I'll just offer this cursory argument and then you probe where you want more explanation or justification. So. It's my conclusion after a lot of work that this is the core problem we face as a cognitive agent, as, an, as a kind of being that is exercising intelligence in order to be able to solve a wide variety of problems in a wide variety of domains. This is the problem we face, and there's many dimensions to it. So one aspect of the problem is there's so much you could pay attention to right now. The amount of information that you could pay attention to in your environment is combinatorially explosive. It's vast. The amount of information you can draw on from your memory also, and all the ways you could combine that information, you could combine aardvark and Australia and the British Empire in some weird way, right? And so all the possible combinations, combinatorially explosive. All the different sequences of behavior I can generate. I could move this finger and this finger. I could move them together. Like it's astronomically all the possibilities I could consider combinatorially explosive. And yet this is what you and I are doing right now. Out of all of that, we're zeroing in on the relevant information, doing the relevant action, remembering the relevant things, et cetera. And this is an ability we can't give yet to artificial intelligence. Now that ability to zero in on relevance realization, uh, on relevant information, sorry, I call relevance realization, 
and it's recursive relevance realization. You're doing it at multiple levels of, of product. Now, this is not what you do, Rachel. You don't consult all the information and judge if it's relevant or not. You don't look over there and say, no, that's not relevant. No, that's not relevant. That's not relevant. Thinking about Brazil isn't relevant. Remembering the last time I took a bath isn't relevant, right? You don't. You somehow ignore most of that information and zero in on the relevant information. And what th that means to you is you're connecting to something that gets your attention, makes you care about some information. So, it, right, it gets your attention, it's salient to you. It makes you care about some information rather than our, other information. It arouses your metabolism because you have to be properly aroused to calibrate to the situation. You're taking a risk nevertheless with your precious time, your precious resource. And so that's being loaded into your evaluate. So do you see how this is all right? This is not cold calculation. This is how you are binding yourself to a situation and how that situation is bound to you. Now you want that binding, and I'm going to use a word and I'm going to use, and it's provocative, religio, which actually means binding, right? That's where we get the word religion from, but that binding isn't just happenstance. It has to bind you to the situation so that you can reliably solve your problems. Now that sense of being connected to the world, to yourself and to other people, because very often, very, very often, we are solving problems in concert with other people. That ability to be connected is absolutely central. And it's below, it's below your reasoning. It's below how things are obvious to you. It's below even how you can represent things. It's primordial and fundamental to you being a cognitive agent. So anything that denudes that will make you start to lose a sense of your cognitive agency, which is a profound sense of threat, alienation, anxiety, absurdity. Anything that enhances it will make you feel like your cognitive agency is more effective, more powerful, more real. That's the argument in a nutshell. This is making me think about uh, all of the research that's coming out about how our attention span in the, the modern world is sort of exponentially decreasing. And when yes. our children are struggling to focus, we are struggling to focus. I certainly can't read in the way that I was able to read when I was 12 years old, just sit down. Um, and so do we know on, on the, the neurological level um, what relevance realization, where it's taking place? And therefore, are living in a world that just hijacks our dopamine receptors 24-7, is that actually, and we say, you know, it's making us depressed. Is this why it's making us depressed? Because it's inhibiting our ability to connect with the things that are meaningful with, to us and build those relationships. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the answer to the first question is a very thorny one. About uh, it, it, would be, it wouldn't be located in any one place in the brain It'd be, because you have to be doing it at sort of all scales of processing. So it's recursively. So it's, it's more like, you know, dynamics of how the brain is firing and wiring. And I, I published work on that, but I, I won't go into the detail. But your connection to things like dopamine. Dopamine is not, is not sort of joy juice. Dopamine basically is a salience tagger. It's, it, it's, it says, this is salient. Pay attention to this again in the future. And, and you're right. To the degree to which we are are letting our our attentional machinery and its relationship to salience be hijacked, the degree to which we are undermining our capacity for relevance realization. So much so that people feel simultaneously like there is too much information and they can't tell what they should take seriously and what they should pay attention to. And that has a deleterious effect on human beings. And we're seeing the mental health tsunami. And of course, COVID made it much, much worse because people were thrown back into just basically the internet world, the virtual world. And we are seeing the mental health tsunami. And it's, and it's, and it's, and there's specific kind of research coming out, social media being correlated, you know, especially very fast paced like Instagram and, you know, and things like that being associated with depression, increased anxiety, um, and, and, and people, 
They have more connections than ever, but the number of real friends they have is declining. Uh, and those two are also correlated with each other. So the answer to your question is yes. And so um, while I don't think social media is the cause of the meaning crisis, I think it's an accelerant uh, of the meaning crisis in very, very powerful ways. Now, what I can say, at least to some degree, is um, I produced you know, a 50-episode series where each episode is about an hour and it's complex argumentation, and yet it has turned out to be quite popular, which means people are capable of investing um, complex, committed, long-term attention to something if it goes towards something that is, here it comes, relevant to them. And I think you know, the meaning crisis is very relevant to very many people. Is there a singular cause of the meaning crisis or is it a cumulative effect? Um, and also, is there a moment in human history when when it began or when it started to get worse? Because it does seem right now, sort of the, since 2008, the financial crash, maybe just perhaps because that was when all the bullshit was revealed to be exactly yeah, what it yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it does yeah. just seem that the, the meaning crisis has become exponentially uh, disastrous and we're all headed to go off a cliff. So I think the, the, the meaning crisis has uh, multiple causes and there's two broad types of cause it has. One are historical forces and one are perennial problems. The perennial problems all come from this fact, I would argue. The very processes that make us intelligently adaptive make us perennially susceptible to self-destructive, deceptive, self-destructive behavior. The very fact that I'm ignoring all of this information means there's a, there is some chance that the information I'm ignoring is actually the needed information. And I'm regarding it as irrelevant what I, I need. And we, and we have, we catch when that, that, when the dynamics of our cognition correct that mistake, when we have an insight, when we do, oh, I was thinking of it like this. I was thinking she was angry but she's actually afraid. Oh my gosh, I wish I saw that earlier. We have an insight, we have an aha moment and we realize that we've done that. Now, the opposite of having an aha moment is remaining locked in a frame that is causing you to misframe reality in a fundamental way. That's at the core of self-deception. And, 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 and so what, what you don't want to do is, well, turn off relevance realization. That's what we'll do and we'll stop being what, you can't do that. So what you need are you need right? You need ecologies of practices that can intervene to ameliorate that self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior and heal and enhance the, the connectedness to reality that it puts at risk. Across cultures and across time, I would put it to you, that's what people have meant by wisdom. And that part of what we're suffering now is a wisdom famine. That, that, right? So the perennial problem is we need wisdom. The historical problem is we don't know where to go for it. All of there's been a whole there's been a historical movement that has undermined the worldviews that typically, and these have been religious worldviews that have given us ecologies of practices where we can go to practice self-transcendence, ameliorating the ways in which we are self-deceptive and self-destructive. We don't even like the old words for being self-deceptive and self-destructive. The old word for that in Christianity, I'm not a Christian, by the way, is sin. We don't want to talk about sin anymore. We are, we are, no, sin, no, we don't talk about sin. Who talks about sin, right? Okay, fine. Because you find that the religious framework within which that was homed no longer seems relevant to you. Fair enough. But that doesn't mean you can now ignore the problem that was named by that term. You can't then say, well, I don't have to worry about self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. You sure do. You sure do. And so, I, and again, I do this with my students. Where do you go for information? And they hold up their phones, like, ah, the internet. Where do you go for knowledge? And they're, they're more skeptical and jaundiced and everything. And uh, well, I guess science, the university. And I say, where do you go for wisdom? And there's a silence. And um, I, I mentioned that in the conversation I had with Lex because that has been a reliable and powerful experience for me. And it's just like, right, right? And so there have been historical forces that have undermined the religious worldview. I'm not here to say we should roll the clock back. I'm a scientist, okay? 
But one of the problems science has is it provides this explanation of the world, but doesn't give us yet a good explanation of how we generate science. So science itself doesn't have a home in that scientific worldview, and we don't have a home within that scientific worldview. And that's, of course, deeply problematic if you want to, people to feel very connected to themselves, each other, and the world. So we've had this historical movement that has undermined how we home ecologies of practices, wisdom institutions. We don't have alternatives. I think the, our attempts to make politics, we keep trying and we're trying it again right now. We keep saying, well, what we'll do is we'll make politics the place that does all this heavy lifting. And then what we do is we get it and, and we're getting into it again. And we did it also in the 19th century when we drenched the world in blood in the first half of the 20th century, in which we created mass pseudo-religious political movements and drenched the world. And so we're going to try, we're trying again. We're going to, and, 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 and what you see is the paradox that everything is becoming politicized, uh, political, right? But everybody feels disenfranchised from politics. They think it's corrupt and full of bullshit and, you know, and, and gridlocked and, and all this kind of, and, and that paradox tells you that people somehow know intuitively that that framing isn't the right way, but they don't know what the alternative is. And so that's where we are. Can I jump yeah. in and ask you yeah. though? I mean, if if having a relationship to a thing, um, and then you know the anonymous groups, it's like a, a thing bigger than yourself. Um, so yeah. having a relationship to this thing that is bigger than yourself, maybe this unknowable thing, and that can provide meaning and and yeah. Yeah. and also can provide a framework. It can provide it can provide a framework through myths and narratives for wisdom. If this kind of unknowable thing, whether it is, um, you know, in, personified like a god in, in a, um, you know, Christianism or Judaism or, or Islam or any of the others, um, or whether it is uh, the one or the Tao um, or the yeah. Shukaya, I can't quite remember what you said for Buddhism. Shunyata. Right. So it, that seems to work for human beings on some level. And we'll get into uh, hopefully when it starts to not work as well. Yeah, and that's yeah, important. Yeah, yeah. Of human beings, why not when we have an authoritarian figure, when we project that onto a person, um, a dictator, a strong man, why does that not provide the same wisdom and meaning then in that example? Right. So for, there's two. That's excellent question. Um, and I think it's a very pertinent question because we keep trying that right now, too. Right. We, 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 and um, and of course, uh, at, at, at all levels, you know, from from presidents to the local yoga guru who is exploiting uh, his or her students. Totally, I think this is a pertinent question. There's two important uh, uh, points for that. First is politics now, not always. My, my, no, I'm not talking about how Plato or Aristotle thought about politics, right? But politics now is, well, look, look at the word we call it, ideology. It's all about propositions. It's all about beliefs. It's a, they are belief systems. Here's another thing, and again, I can argue this at great length, but I'll just make it at a cursory point. Most of our knowing that gives us meaning is not propositional knowing. It's procedural, perspectival, or participatory. And the political ideological systems do not give us practices or ecologies of practices for those non-propositional knowing. So all they do is manipulate, ask you to affirm sets of beliefs and then you know, vote on them or march in the street on them, et cetera. But how do you transform your skills and your states of mind and presence and consciousness and your traits of character such that you have virtue and you can, vir with virtuosity, uh, track what is most real in a way that is conducive to a good life for you and other people? That is largely left unaddressed or at most given weak symbolic uh, 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 outlet in, in in political ideologies. Secondly, and this is a convergent point about the one, the Tao, Shunyata, God, at, at least within um, the non-theistic or classical theistic view of God. Uh, God, it, God or ultimate reality is an inexhaustible fount of ever renewing intelligibility. What I mean by that is Let's remember you said we let, let's just quickly attention and relevance realization. Well, how does your attention do it? The attention basically does 
it's doing two things. It's doing more than two, but just two. Right now, part of your attention is wandering away. It's trying to wander away and mind wander, uh, and and it's it, it's introducing new things you could think about. And then you've got another one putting selective pressure, killing most of those off. But hey, but that's good. I'll bring that in, and then I'll wander and then I'll select. And, I'll, and you see what you're doing? You're constantly evolving. So you're right, staying with things, but balancing that against introducing new things. So you're constantly evolving, and. In sort of a nutshell, that's my argument about how your brain does relevance realization. By the way, adaptivity is not something in you or in the world. It's a real relation between you and the world. It's a way of being connected to your environment, right? Um, so if that's the case, if I were to ask you, well, what's the ultimate form of life? What's evolution pushing towards? You'd go, there isn't one. You, you've misunderstood evolution. Evolution is about constant change in a constantly changing world. It's about, you know, a world that will never be finished in any sense and a reality that's never finished. And therefore, we have to constantly evolve with it. In a similar way, there is no one thing, right, is the finish of relevance realization. And I think that's one of the mistakes we've got around sacredness, that sacredness is the utopia, the final resting place, the perfect being. I think this is bullshit we should put aside. And I think instead what you see, and I think you see this in a lot of these traditions, is that no, 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 the, the ultimate is no kind of thing. It is an inexhaustible source of new intelligibility. We adapt, we change, it changes, we end that, and we can't exhaust it. The Tao is a well that is never used up. If you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. What is the name of God? My name is that I am the unnameable. These are from all these different traditions. That's my answer. So any human being that offers you an ideology is misdirecting you, putting you into the tyranny of the propositional, misdirecting you from the kinds of knowing that are knowings that are fundamentally connective kinds of knowing. And secondly, they are claiming to be a completeness where, where reality is not, that relevance realization comes to no conclusion. What it, ought, what it seeks is continuity of contact. Just again, like your relationship to someone you love, you don't seek to complete the relationship. What would that mean? We're done. And I'm glad we made it. We finished the relationship. Yay. Good. Instead, what you want is you want them to keep growing, you to keep growing, you grow through each other, and you maintain a faithfulness, not a faith, but a faithfulness, a continuity of contact with them. Would your argument for why religions can lead people astray, um, and that's a terribly formulated sentence, I know, but essentially for when, when religions do go wrong, uh, when we yeah. have crusades and when we have war and when we have horror all in the name of God, oh, yes. would yeah. your argument then be that it is because the middlemen and the priests and the gurus and everybody that puts themselves between that person and the unknowable thing and tries to gatekeep that relationship, that that is when um, horrors are done in the name of, of that which is sacred? Yeah. And, and I think that's fundamentally right. I think when credo uh, it's, it, we get the word creed from it, but funnily enough, the word credo, uh, like uh, believe, belaben originally meant to give your heart to something. It didn't mean didn't mean to utter a proposition as true, right? It, again, it was religio, how how you're about. I think when creeds uh, take um, take priority over that religio, um, instead of being in proper service to it, I think we start to get in trouble. And you and you're right. We we continually see like the Protestant Reformation, Mahayana, thing, things like this, in which people are trying to remove or improve the, the mediators. Uh, yes. Now, see, see, again, and, and I use this term, and I use this term because I want ha it to have the kind of horrific undertone to it. There is no final solution to these things, right? And, and, and 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 the greatest danger is when someone says, "I have the final solution. I can tell you how we can permanently fix." Right? Because what we have to do is we we have to put in the mediators because we have to bridge 
We have to help ourselves frame. We have to learn to what it, we should take seriously, what we should ignore. And yet we have to be able to constantly revise those, check them, alter them, have insight restructuring about them. Uh, but if we, if we, it, you know, think about it, if you were constantly moment by moment, putting your relationship into question, let's start it over. Let's restructure it fundamentally. It never grows. Never, right. And so you're trying to get this, this sweet spot, this balance. Um, and there's no rule for that. There's no method for that. Um, just like there's no rule or method for what it is to be a living creature. This leads us, I think, in really into um, the crisis of the world today, beyond the the, the mean, beyond the meaning crisis. I mean, I'm sure the meaning crisis is the root of all of our crises, but we are we are in a poly crisis, and certainly with the people I interview and and some of the the work that I do, the the sort of fundamental difficulty that we face right now is that there is no final solution. There is no That's one right. thing to say to people or there is no one way to assuage people of the future. Um, it is essentially a confrontation with, we do have limits. We don't know exactly what we're doing. To do better, we are going to have to work together. Um, we're, I can't tell you what step 10 is. We're gonna have to take step one, two, and three first. Um, it yes. might work if we all go there together. It's not gonna work if we don't. And to confront that, I mean, not only does that like fill people with a kind of existential angst um, and sort of horror, it seems like such an impossible thing to say when your opponent is, um, you know, typically the right wing, um, although yeah. lots of different wings, who have such a concrete black and white narrative that say, if you follow us, this is what the world will look like. So yeah. even though finding meaning and finding uh, a system of solutions, not the final solution, but a system of solutions to navigate the future, uh, which is currently going off a cliff, demands a willingness to confront the unknown and demands a sort of willingness also to confront our own human condition. Um, and that could be really, really exciting. To me, my worry is that we will not get there in this crucial decade because it is such a big ask, especially for a precarious population, especially when there's billions of people still living without education, without access yes. to water, without access yes. to food. And then the privilege, those of us that have shelter, have food, have water, are rendered so precarious by the quote unquote free market that yeah. the vast majority of them don't have time to think about anything beyond um trying to find some vague meaning in quite a miserable existence that is absolutely put down upon by a set of elites who are equally miserable, but at least they get to run the world or whatever it is they think they're having fun doing. I mean, how do we start to unpick that equation to do better together? Yeah, um, I think that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Um, it resonated very powerfully. Very, It was very eloquent um, and even elegant. Um, so I, I want to I wanna work into this very carefully, if you'll allow me, because I think this is the question. So first of all, the, uh, let's call, I'll use uh, Thomas Bjorkman's terms, the metacrisis, which is this interconnected swarm of crises around energy and economics and environmental degradation. And they're all increasingly interpenetrating and, 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 and right. And of course, and they're corrupting our legal systems and our political systems in powerful ways. So that whole mess, right? And the, and the problem is uh, th what we need for those is exactly what is being crippled by the meaning crisis, which is how do we zero in on the, what really matters and how do we fit ourselves to it so that we can make a difference to it? So we need wisdom, right? And this is the very thing that we're starving from, right? So the two crises are, are not independent. If we don't, don't afford people more wisdom, we can't expect them to be able to marshal their individual and collective resources to address the problems. Secondly, we whatever we're doing to save the planet, I propose to you that it will require a significant impact in our standard of living. And people don't want to hear that, but wait, just give me one sec, right? People, right, yeah, subjective well-being, very important to people, but people will will actually sacrifice subjective well-being for increased meaning in life. They do it every time they have a child. Because when you have a child, 
all of the measures of objective well-being go down. Your health, your sleep, your relationship to your partner, your finances, you lose time, you get sick, your your lifespan, your finances, blah, 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 everything. Why do you do it then? You do it because you are connected to something that has a reality and a value independent of your egocentrism. I mean, trying to be a good parent is the most significant challenge to your egocentrism of anything I've ever been through, including the meditation retreats, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we need, we need wisdom and, uh, and because wisdom promises enhanced meaning in life, it can offer people the one thing they will give up subjective well-being for. So the two problems are not separable from each other. If we, if we try, and I think we've been trying to solve the meta crisis without addressing the meaning crisis, we will get nowhere. And I put it to you, that is precisely what we have been doing. We have been laying out the facts and the art, and we're getting nowhere. That's my proposal. That to, to, these are so it's not optional for us to not address the meaning crisis if we want to address the meta crisis. That's the first point I want to make. The second point is uh, the one that is undeniable, um, which is we may not have enough time. Uh, and I have no argument against that. I, 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 I say to people, put on my tombstone, neither nostalgia nor utopia, right? Those are not options. And I have no, there's no teleology, there's no teleology at work, making sure we're going to pull through somehow. We may, we, other, other civilizations have collapsed before, right? Um, and they usually collapse for exactly that network, you know, complex systems theory for that network of problems that. Uh, that they can't solve. Uh, and so we could collapse. Um, and I, I can't offer you any, oh no, here, blah, 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 blah. And you go, oh, I, I, have, I do not have that to offer you. What I can say in response is two things. Nevertheless, the only moral virtuous thing for me to do is to try the best I can to save the world. That sounds pretentious. For me, because of my previous argument, Addressing the meaning crisis is precisely how I am trying to help make that possible. If we all fail, and we might, then what I say to you is, even if I fail, the efforts that I'm doing and other people are doing about building these, and there's a lot happening, Rachel, which does give me hope. There's all these emerging communities of practice all these new ecologies of practice. There's a religion that's not a religion that's being born right now in the in the world. And I know about it. I, I'm participating in it. I'm helping to promote it and develop it and make sure it's self-monitoring and try and growing as virtuously as it can. Even if that fails to save our civil, perhaps it can lay light the candles for the next. Just like, and I'm again, I'm not promoting anything here, but in a similar way in which Christianity created a new subculture alternative to the Roman imperial system. And then when the Roman Empire, Western Roman Empire collapsed, there was a new civil, there was the, the, there was the grammar and the foundation for a new civilization waiting to go. People didn't have to start from absolute scratch. They still had to do a lot. Um, and so for me, that's my answer to you. Um, uh, we may not do it. I'm trying my best because it's the moral thing to do. And if, if, even if I fail, maybe we, we can help the next civilization get started faster. Sorry, I wish I could give you a, 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 a cheerier answer, but that's it. Well, you, I mean, you can't, right? And it would be contrary to everything that you've said. Um, and I think the point is that yeah. it shouldn't be, yeah. you know, and it, it shouldn't come from one person. And I think that one of the most exciting things about the poly crisis and, and the mini crisis and the confluence of all of these really terrible things is that it is beyond one human brain so maybe maybe yes. this time we will be forced to act collectively in a way that was previously unimaginable that that is so exciting there is so much uh, um fertility in in the crisis and we have seen as well you know i always spout on about this but um that study that was done um uh, well, it was a longitudinal study that was done during World War II on, on Britons, and it continued for 20 years thereafter. And Britons were happiest during World War II because they had something to yeah. live for, and they came yeah. together, and they sacrificed, and they worked as a community, and and it was just so, it was terrible and devastating, but it was worthwhile. Um, it was real, by the way, too. Yes. You can't, Actually, you can't... Can we go back and... 
Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted yeah. you, but can we can we go back into this 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 word real and and, yeah. and get continue to get into it a little bit because I think in a world of fake news, um, discerning what is real or even having an understanding for what real is is really important. yeah, uh, I think so. And um, uh, yeah, sorry I interrupted you, but I think part of what nobody would have said what was happening to Britain during World War II was just an intersubjective opinion or a shared belief because people are dying, buildings are being destroyed, uh, right? Uh, people are being dislocated in undeniable ways, very much the way, like, it, it's, I mean, we try, we, people are trying to make COVID, oh, it's just a conspiracy. They're trying to make it that, but it keeps failing because the people who say that end up dying and uh, the supposed elites end up dying and all kinds of stuff. So. Um, what does it mean to say that something's real, I think is, um, really important. And I think what we need to do is to look very, very carefully at, well, I need to introduce one concept here. Uh, relevance realization works in terms of opponent processing, two things that are working in opposite directions, but are right locked together. Like part of, part of your attention is wandering away and other parts bringing it in and selecting and they're constantly pushing and pulling on each other or your your parasympathetic system part of it your sympathetic system is trying to raise your arousal and other parts trying to parasympathetic and they're in opponent processing and, and that's all through your cognition you, it's probably even the case that the two hemispheres are working in an opponent processing fashion they definitely are when you have an insight i would say okay so reality realization works that way too. So if you pay very careful attention, we have two different senses of realness. One is how things are confirmed. Look, this is real because see how it fits into everything, confirmed, firmed together. See how it fits in with everything else and it's coherent and it all fits together and it all makes sense. And then we got, oh, that's real because it was shocking and surprised and so counterintuitive and I never expected that. And that's precisely why it's real. And these two give us this opponent processing of what realness is. And so we need to, to develop, right, a model of realness that appropriately tries to put them together. Now, we do to a degree. Think about how science, science works on trying to get all this confirmation, but it's always open to falsification. It's always open to the experiment surprising you in ways you couldn't possibly foresee it. And we're constantly negotiating, but we need to understand how to turn that into something that is generalizable across many domains of our life. So it should be at work, not just where I'm in the lab doing, all, but when I'm talking to you, how am I trying to get a conversation that is constantly playing between them? And I want to put that point together with your previous point. Most of our cognition, most of our problem solving is done with the collective intelligence that's running on distributed cognition. Way before the internet linked computers together to release the power of distributed computation, culture linked people together to release the power of distributed cognition, collective intelligence. How can we get our dialogue to best find that opponent processing between the two senses of real such that we can transform the collective intelligence into collective wisdom. And that is my, that is my current project right now. This is this project that I call Dialectic into Dialogos. It is, it is at the core of the next video series that I'm going to release. It's called After Socrates. It'll be 22 episodes long. Uh, we've, fil we've filmed 17 of the 22 so far, so we're almost ready. And unlike the previous one, it won't just be lectures, it'll be lectures, There'll be points for discussion and reflection. And I also teach a program of practices, like a pedagogical succession of practices. So you're also training skills and virtues as along with the beliefs that you're forming. Because learning how we can get into dialogos with each other is, I think, part of the answer about how we can both refine our sense of realness and tap into the collective, tap into collective intelligence and educate it into collective wisdom. And we can bring those two together and they will act as reciprocal checks and balances on each other. Is it perfect? No, nothing can be. 
Is it much better than what we have? Yes, I think you can make a good argument for that. Fascinating. This this makes me think all the Guardian headline that I saw just about yesterday, and it was like, um, uh, oh, you know, the most important thing in life is is relationships, and it was about quantum yeah. theory. Um, yes. And I just started to uh, read a little bit around uh, quantum theory because somebody told me about, you know, these electrons that are neither here nor there. And I was like, geez, that's fascinating. We need to know more about that. Yeah. And how it is all about that things are not really things in themselves. And, you know, thinking back to all the German philosophers that when they're translated, it's capital T hyphen I, you know, thing in itself. Everything exists in relationship to another thing. And it is these relationships and these tensions uh, you call, you know, opponent press processing and collective intelligence. It's like nothing can exist uh, independently of another thing. Even our own bodies, you know, we are bacteria. Yeah. We've got foreign yeah. bodies within us. Mankind, humankind exists in relationship to everything else. Um, and people, and it seems to me um, that for me, the meaning crisis and the poly crisis is this complete lack of um, awareness or conservation or celebration of relationships, whether it is our relationship to uh, them, whether it is our relationship it, to our community, whether it is our relationship to the earth, to our food, to where we're going, to our past, to our future. And it does seem as like this kind of horrible, uh, exponentially worsening hangover of um, the scientific revolution, which, uh, you know, thank God there was one by the same token, but plus capitalism and industrialization and how everything just became atomized and siloed oh, uh, and yeah. individualized. And I can now answer your, I can answer your question about where it all really started and where it really all started with the advent of nominalism, which was a philosophical position that what ultimately really exists are individual things, concrete objects, you know, like this are what is most real. That replaced a platonic model in which relations uh, are, are, were, were more real, um, patterns um, are more real. Um, and one of the things that quantum mechanics, and by the way, relativity, relativity says that re relations are real. That's what relativity is. Things are, this is relative to the speed of light and your reference frame and all that sort of stuff. Um, they're both telling us, and so there's now a movement on in the philosophy of science called structural realism, which says, no, no, the relationships are actually more real than the things related. Um, and so reality is ultimately not thingy. Um, by the way, which lines up with the ancient ideas that ultimate reality is not a thing. It's, it's, it's a no thingness. Um, and we only get the negative version of no thingness when we think of nothingness. Um, and so. Um, that's what we have to be able to recover the overwhelmingly positive aspect of nothingness without seeing it as just the lack of reality in nothingness. That's part of what we've lost and we need to recover. Um, can, and, sorry, can you explicate that a little bit further? I, I haven't quite grasped sure. things. Okay. So, so nihilism, there's, there's nothing, but there's nothing ultimately real. They're, they're right. And, and people will say it's just a vast abyss and nothingness. Um, and so what they're saying and what do they mean is what does the word literally mean? There's no thing there. And since things are the basis of reality, there's no reality. But if ultimately reality is not a thing, like we were talking about earlier, there's a version, if you'll put it that way, of no thingness that is not about privation and lack, it's about an inexhaustible source from which all intelligibility stems. And because we have lost the ability to see the difference between them, we can't, we can only see the dark version and we can't see through it to the light version in, in, in a powerful way. We've lost what the, we've lost the virtues and the virtuosity that allow us to distinct, but if you read the Neoplatonist, like Plotinus, he says, okay, what you first need to do to be wise is you need to be able to distinguish the no thingness that's a privation uh, from the nothingness, I'll say, that's a privation from the no thingness that's ultimate reality. You have to learn, and not just with words, but you have to really learn to see and experience this in order uh, to get at uh, uh, a reality. One more thing, by the way, notice how Notice how, you know, both quantum mechanics and relativity are bumping us up against that confirmation and 
mystery, that which surprises us. Quantum mechanics is like, we're trying to get all this confirmation and then we keep getting stuff that is absolutely what, right? If the electron is not in any place, it's not a thing. That's right. Maybe it isn't, right? And, and, and you know, and relativity, how can there be black holes? Like, what, what does that mean? Right? And all, all that sort of stuff. But we need to get back to the place where you can see that not just at the edges of our scientific endeavors, but see it in the face of your beloved. Because for every way in which they are intelligible to you, there are ways in which they withdraw beyond your grasp of them and continue to surprise them if your relationship is a living one as opposed to one that is dying. There's a no thingness to your partner. There's a no thingness to them. And in the end, you and your partner don't want to be treated just as things. Of course, we're things in one sense. Here's my body. But in another sense, we say, I'm not just a thing. And a lot of our protests, and a lot of our protests are people saying in a somewhat confused, somewhat convoluted fashion, I'm not a thing. Yes, you're right. But that makes no sense if you can't distinguish no thingness from nothingness. Mm. And so the, then, of course, the relationship itself would also be a no thingness. And it could, would it be the yeah. only no thingness that you can both know together? And is that um, why it's sacred? Is that why I think, I think that's, or any kind of between, between people is quite sacred? This, this is Plato's argument that Eros, when Eros is turned that way, this is the, this is the whole point of the dialogue, the symposium. When Eros is turned that way, it is a way of coming into ratio, right proportioned. We, that's where we get rationality from, but it originally means right proportion, religio, right proportioned connectedness, right relationship. Um, yeah, I think so. But of course, we have to remember there are many kinds uh, 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 and this is of, of love, right? Of course, you not only love your romantic partner, you can love your children, you can love your siblings. You can also have a deep platonic, and, and that's intended, uh, friendship love, um, and, 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 of, and then we, we, we've, we've lost another kind that we used to have that people uh, rediscover when we do the dialectic into Dialogos workshops. You can have fellowship, which is you're not my friend, right? You're not my sister. You're not my lover. But you and I are bound together with other people as we co-seek wisdom together. That's fellowship. So I think I have, I, I have yeah, a little anecdote that I think you'd really like. Um, yes, when I please. used to teach in France on, on Valentine's Day, and I always do like a little uh, a, a class on love. And I, the starting point would be Eros, Philia, Storche, and um, and so for listeners, that's uh, Eros is you know, romantic love, Philia is um, fellowship love, brotherly love, Storche is the love for your elders and for your family. And a yap ye is this love for, for you know, the universe, the unknowable for yes, God. Yeah, um, yeah. And I used to ask my students, you know, I'd walk them through it. And then I would ask them, you know, which ones resonated with them, which ones they felt. And then where they felt it in their bodies. And yes. the vast majority, and I did it every year for four years, they would feel these different kinds of loves in different places, but in the same place collectively. So they yes. all felt eros as a kind of um, uh, zing, you know, a buzz up and down their torso. They felt a yappy all over their bodies. They felt storse in their stomach. You know, the vast, vast, vast majority, they shared this bodily sensation yes. of these concepts yes. that they'd only just been introduced to. Yes. And I just yes. thought that was completely miraculous. That's beautiful. And that goes towards the fact that our cognition is inherently embodied and enacted. It's not just sets of beliefs in, that you've stored in your long-term memory. Mm. Yes. Yes, it really, really does. You know, John, I'm, I'm, I can't take up too much of your time, but there is one sort of final question I want to ask you, or perhaps one Please. question. Please. Um, and that is this sort of, you know, disavowal of the, the goodness of humankind, you know, considering we are really making a mess of uh, our own existence right now. People, um, there's a theme of, of thinking of humankind as a bacteria, you know, that the earth and all living things would be better off if, if we went extinct and we disappeared. 
And I suppose you kind of alighted uh, on it earlier, um, talking about the evolution of our, of our current ability and why relevance realization would have been useful and maybe now why it is kind of malfunctioning today. But I suppose my really large abstract question is why cognitively, do you, why do we have these cognitive abilities to malfunction? And does that perhaps hark back to that religious, myth, you know, Jesus in the desert, the, you know, the 40 nights that we kind of have to suffer or trial or explore and come through. Otherwise, the world would be a little bit utopic and, and heavenly and I don't know, I, I think, not allowed. <laughs> well, I mean, it goes back to the point I made. Well, well, I mean, it starts by going back to the point I made that the very processes that make us adaptive make us perennially susceptible to self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. So you invoke Jesus in that sense. They may we're always susceptible to sin, and and the and the and the Greek word in the New Testament is missing the mark. You're shooting at a target and you miss the mark. If you've ever done archery, and I have, if you shoot where your eyes are telling you to shoot, you'll miss the target. You have to make a mental adjustment to overcome the way your vision is biasing you to shoot in the wrong direction, and and that's what's getting at that. We have to learn that ability, um, and we've lost the wherewithal of, of training that and we've lost along with sort of no normalism we lost the idea of uh, the transformative requirement for truth so you get with descartes and with science the proposal that as long as i have the right method i can get all I, all truths are accessible to me now this goes against an, uh, uh, the view that it, it rejected the ancient view which is no, no, there are truths that are only available to you after you go through significant transformation. That unless you transform, you, all the non-propositional stuff does not connect to the world in the right way to disclose the depths of reality to you. And you know this is true, again, again, using the analogy of your romantic relationship. You're not going to get to the depth of your partner unless you're willing to go through significant transformation. And they have to, of course, reciprocate. By the way, that's how you get people to fall in love when they coordinate so that they keep opening up to each other, they do reciprocal opening, um, mutually accelerating disclosure will get people to fall in love. And so but we, we have lost the, uh, I think, and that's what Jesus, I, I, the myth is showing that he has to, he, even Jesus, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean any insult by that, right? But he's obviously a high status character within the new testament right even jesus has to go into the desert and has to go through significant transformation in order to have the right relationship with ultimate reality god the father right so, and this is myths the myths have been telling us this that we need to remember because myths are about remembering truths we've forgotten not about false stories about the distant past right we need to remember that there are truths that are only accessible to us if we're willing to go through fundamental transformation. And I put it to you, that's exactly what we need right now. The, right? And think, of, and think about true not just being proposition. You're true to someone. Or my aim is true. Right? If we, if we want to get all of the truth that we need, we have to be willing to, to save the world. We have to be willing to undergo significant transformation. But in fairness, to everybody, people will not do that unless you give them a plausible proposal as to how you are going to make their lives more meaningful. And we're not doing that. And so we look like the planet pest because we have got ourselves locked into a misframing of what we need. We know at some level, at some level of existential anxiety that we have to undergo significant transformation individually and collectively at all the levels of our cognition and consciousness we remember that the only thing that has really done that for us in the past is religion we remember we can't go back most of us to the established religions and so we're like what do we do what do we do but there is a way out from that there is a way out from that vine so i don't think we have to go ahead I, I don't think we are necessarily the planet pest. I think we could be what we have been in the past, which are the, the, the you know the stewards of the of the world rather than the exporters of it.
if we fell in love again with reality, with being, and with beings, then we would have a loving relationship with it. And we would find that like we find all of our loving relationships inherently valuable. And we would, we would seek to preserve it and not destroy that relationship. Mm, absolutely. That is a beautiful note, I think, to, and an importantly positive note, I think, to end this conversation on. And um, for somebody that's listening to this that would like to cultivate more meaning in their life, beyond watching your 50-part uh, YouTube series, which I will link as well um, in all of the show notes, where, where should people go? What, what got, you know, what's like your top book that you would recommend? Well, first of all, I mean, I did something during COVID, and people may want to tap into that. I did an entire online course day by day. They don't have to do every day. They can, where I did um, the uh, meditation, contemplation, and the cultivation of wisdom. I go through Eastern practices, Western practices, and lay out. Um, and people have for, have done that, formed communities. There's a Discord server associated with my work. There's all kinds of online communities. Uh, there, uh, there's other communities I would point you to. Rafe Kelly's Evolve Move Play, uh, Benito. Benito Roy, uh, take a look at Zach Stein's work, especially on education in the time between worlds, all that stuff. Uh, lead that, um, I think take reading the book, What is Ancient Philosophy by Pierre Hadeau can help us reconnect to our own wisdom traditions. People are doing it right now. Stoicism is going through this huge revival, and that's not a coincidence, right? And Neoplatonism is going through a huge revival. Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which until recently was obscure to most people is going through a huge upsurge in North America, precisely because I would argue of its connections to the Neoplatonic wisdom tradition. There's lots there. Get involved with an ecology of practices within a community that seems to be healthy and happy and that is both respectful of the past but is oriented towards science in the sense that they're not trying to deny or or, or pretend the science, that science isn't there. Because that's that's a fool's errand. Fantastic. Yeah, I think if we had like another two hours, it would be really interesting to go more into the tension um, or this perceived tension that I think is deliberately hammed up, but we don't have time. Maybe, maybe if I'm cheeky, I'll invite you back on to discuss the tension between uh, I'll, I'll come. I'll come. I'll come back on, Rachel. I've enjoyed this immensely, so I'd be happy to talk with you again. Oh, I'm so pleased. Thank you so much. Who would you like to platform? I think the 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 person you should talk to next is the person who has tried to reformulate the scientific worldview that is consonant with everything I've been saying, and he's been a partner with me on several of my video series, and that's Greg Enriquez. Um, and his, he gives a big picture model that restructures our scientific understanding. He calls it, uh, so, uh, the crossing the enlightenment gap, the gap that the enlightenment created. Um, and, um, I think he would give you a over, he would give you a way of thinking about the world and science and psychology in which things are knitted back in such a way that everything that I'm talking about has a worldview that properly homes it. Right, wonderful. I would love to speak with him. John, it has been such a pleasure and completely mind blown. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Rachel. It's been a great pleasure. If you want to learn more about the meaning crisis, I've put links to John's work in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to this channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon, where you'll also get access to my weekly essays. The link is in the description box below. As always, thank you to the Planet Critical community who make all of this work possible. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week.